This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, Losing Its Appetite, China gradually moves away from coal-powered energy as it boosts efforts to curb pollution. But what happens to the people who rely on it for a living? And Going Green, how some countries in Asia and beyond are doing their share to create a future of sustainable growth. I'm Ryan Chua, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. In 2015, nearly all countries in the world reached a landmark deal to reduce carbon emissions. The Paris Accord was seen as the first step in what's expected to be a long process to slow climate change. Here in China, the fight against global warming has involved relying less and less on coal, a cheap but heavily polluting energy source that powered the economy for decades. But on the ground, the reality is far more complex. In a city up north that was once at the forefront of China's coal boom, people working in the industry are feeling the pinch. Datong, a city built on coal where generations of workers toiled to extract the fossil fuel that would power China's economic boom for decades. A family of mine workers, like many in Datong, the ones owe their living to the city's coal industry. 77-year-old Wen Aigong became a miner in 1959 when he left his village for the first time. Despite the hardships, he worked in the mines until retirement allowing him to give his family a decent life. His son Ziping followed in his footsteps, like other sons of mine workers. The 45-year-old has been a coal miner for 20 years now and has witnessed the changes that swept the industry through the years. So,虽然我们也在一起有热爱这个美美矿这个这方面的工作吧。小时候父亲很辛苦的，回来回家一回家这个洗澡了什么的，各方面不好，各各方面的挺不方便的。我们现在这个条件啦，嗯，这个改善
这就是要更好的发挥政府作用，对，在根据市场需求，对煤炭的产能做一个政策性的调整。But it's also about China's growing role in the global campaign to slow the effects of climate change, a dramatic turnaround for the world's top coal consumer and carbon emitter. China's coal consumption began declining in 2014. Now the goal is to cap total capacity at 4.1 billion tons by 2020 and reduce coal's share in the country's energy structure to below 58 percent. Coal-fired power plants are closing as well. In March 2017, Huanang power plant in the Chinese capital of Beijing, which often suffers from heavy smog, ended its operations. If we go not so far back, 10 years ago, uh, economic development and uh, environmental protection was perceived as, you know, uh, uh, contradictory uh, to each other. But I think that narrative now uh, has been has been changed in a very significant manner. In a way, I think you can say, just in in the in the time frame of six to seven years, China has transformed itself from you know a climate bad boy to a reluctant leader to now you know uh, with the potential uh, to embrace uh, um, true climate uh, leadership. But on the ground, that big picture can be hard to see. For mine workers in China's so-called coal capital, China's declining coal consumption has meant lower incomes. Some of them, like Ziping, now have to work side jobs. Da Tong's largest coal producer says it's been assisting workers affected by mine closures. Now,我们国家也有政策,就是咱们是在这个推进去产能关闭矿井的过程中,人员要进行妥善的安置。作为我们集团公司呢,就是说我们在调整这个岗位,进行转岗分流,比如现在我们关掉的手机年我们要关
Floating solar farms aren't new, and they've been set up in other countries in the past. But what makes this one remarkable is its sheer scale and capacity. Covering an area the size of 160 football fields, this solar farm has a capacity of 40 megawatts, enough to power some 15,000 homes for an entire year. Its workers include former coal miners driven out of the downsizing industry. Li Jingyang spent 30 years digging coal underground. Today, he's in charge of preparing steel frames for solar panels. For now, coal remains China's main energy source. But experts believe domestic pressures to tackle pollution and the global campaign to reduce carbon emissions could accelerate coal's demise. That, in turn, will have a significant impact globally. That's very important because over the past 10 years, China's coal consumption single-handedly contributed to 50 percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So if, you don't, if, if your you know, coal uh, boom story is over in China, half of your global greenhouse gas boom story is, is over. For workers like Ziping, coal's slow death in China presents daunting challenges and painful adjustments. But he says he understands if that would bring a future of bluer skies and cleaner air. Duping says he wants to continue working in the mines for as long as he's needed. But as the industry declines before his very eyes, he knows he'll be the last in his family. China's coal consumption rose slightly in 2017 for the first time in three years, underscoring the challenges that remain in the campaign for clean energy. Still, many experts believe China is on track to significantly reduce coal's share in its energy mix by 2020. Next on Assignment Asia, we travel around Asia and Europe to explore prospects for sustainable growth. Stories of hope, triumph, innovation, and change. We uncover the truth and go great lengths to tell a story. Get to know ordinary people with extraordinary stories and see Asia from an Asian perspective. This is Assignment Asia. Expect the unexpected. For generations, humankind's quest for economic growth has led to massive deforestation, a dramatic loss in biodiversity, and rising global temperatures. But as the world today grapples with the impact of unbridled growth on the environment, there have been stronger calls for sustainable ways of growing economies and improving standards of living. Jack Barton set out on a global mission from Asia to Europe to explore solutions, starting in South Korea. South Korea has undergone an incredible transformation over the past half century, growing from one of the world's poorest nations to one of the wealthiest. Initially, economic growth had a positive environmental effect on a country that had lost many species along with massive deforestation. 
if you are too poor, then you cannot afford to make any improvement in terms of environment. So as you grow, as your economy grows, your environmental performance improves to a certain extent. But once you go over that you know, peak, then suddenly the relationship becomes negative. So negative that South Korea now has the worst air pollution among the group of 35 mostly rich nations known as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The reason uh, our environmental performance is not good is that our economic structure or industrial structure is uh, such that it consumes a lot of electricity. And Korea you know, focuses on industry like automobile and shipbuilding and steel. All these heavy industries require consumption of a huge amount of electricity. And uh, most of this electricity is generated through coal you know, power plant. So these power plants uh, you know, pollute a lot. Asian countries like South Korea are benefiting enormously from unprecedented economic activity, but also having to deal with the environmental cost of booming consumer societies. That equation is not a new one. To find out where it all began, we must head to the other side of the world. The Industrial Revolution began here in Britain, a revolution that completely transformed our economies and, in most cases, improved our lives. In England, average life expectancy has climbed from around 40 years in the mid-1800s to almost 80 years old for men and even higher for women. At the same time, the global population has climbed from a little more than one billion people to more than seven and a half billion today. But even though our climate has always been changing, global average temperatures have been rising at an unprecedented rate. Also on the rise is the number of animal species that has become, or is fast becoming, extinct. Spain is in many ways a perfect example of how complex and intertwined the issues of economic growth and the environment are. The country is in the grip of its worst drought in decades. It's led to water shortages, a crisis for farmers and devastating forest fires, even in the wettest region of Galicia. A lot of the blame is being directed at climate change which most scientists agree is, to a significant degree, being driven by human economic activity. Coal and oil are a big, big contributors to the energy production. Electricity production is a major, major contributor to climate change. And then, to a lesser extent, land cover transformations in the tropics, like the burning of forests. But this is relatively small compared to, to energy production and transformation. Higher temperatures in Spain have led to a loss of groundwater. But rainfall is also low, often leading to a desert-creating process known as aridification. The important thing is that the mean precipitation is below 400 millimeters. You get a bit serious problem of drought. And when you get 200 millimeters, you are just in the process of aridification, so the drought might become irreversible. There are many, many areas in Spain which are 200 today, so there is a process of aridification due to the uh, diminishing of, of rain. But also in the areas between 200 and 400, now is increasing the problem, because with the same rain, the, the, the trees and the plants are using more water, so you get more aridification now with the same rain in the past. Spain's important agriculture sector is compounding the crisis. In many of our uh, big rivers, uh, the agriculture uh, uses 90% of the resources. In the dry years, they use all the resources. So. Spain, of course, is just a small part of what is a global crisis being driven by an economic model that has pushed our environment to breaking point. These issues are one issue, two sides of a coin, or, you know, economy, environment, energy, and education. 
they have to discuss these issues as one big theme. Otherwise, you cannot find a sustainable solution. There is now wide awareness about the issue of climate change. Fewer people, though, are aware how fast animal species are disappearing because of global warming or because of big contributors to climate change, like land clearing for agriculture and livestock. So in last degeneration, we have lost half of the wildlife on the planet. We are heading towards two-third decline by 2020. And in mass, as scientists, scientists say, we're heading, we're actually already in a mass extinction. In the UK, many groups like the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds are trying to turn back the tide. About 15% of the UK species are actually regarded as threatened with extinction. And we've seen great declines in large numbers. Our, for example, our farmland bird numbers have dropped by over 50% in the last few decades. So what we see in the UK is the same abroad and possibly even worse in other countries. What is driving this uh, decline in bird numbers? By the far the largest single effect is agriculture. Uh, high productivity, it's better for putting food on the plate, but it's had a real expense on birds and, and other wildlife. We also see other impacts, the effect of urbanisation, expanding towns, and more latterly, climate change. All the drivers, all the things that are acting upon our nature are to do with man. All these things have an impact and they're all tied to the economy. Of course, it's not just birds that have a big impact on the ecosystem. To really see the big picture, we've got to talk about the birds and the bees. Many bee species are suffering what has been dubbed colony collapse syndrome. They are vital in them. It's said that up to 30% of what we eat is dependent on insect pollination. And it's the nice stuff. It's the tomatoes. It is the fruit. It, it, you know, there's the example of the pizza, which if you had a bee-free pizza, well, no tomatoes, olive oil would be very expensive. You'd still have the base, but even the mozzarella cheese, you wouldn't be seeing that there. In Britain, farmers are now working with beekeepers to coordinate when fields will be sprayed with chemicals that are potentially deadly to bees. It's not a cure, but it is a start. Green initiatives are now being rolled out around the world, from California to China to here in Germany, where being green is in many ways the new normal. 100 households in Berlin are taking part in a one-year experiment to try cut their carbon footprint by 40%. The Beza family are among them. They're vegetarian, as they say meat production is a big cause of land clearing, water use and carbon emissions. They only use renewable energy, don't have a television, just cancelled a holiday to Portugal and monitor everything they do. Every time now we, we think that maybe we want to buy something, a product, uh, we think twice. Do we really need it? Where does it come from? How much emission does it cost? How long will it last? If we buy it now, if it will last for 20 years, maybe it's OK. If it will break in the next two years, we will not buy it. It's the only way how we can change the world. Um, and with these kind of initiatives, we can start a discussion about um, our own consumption. This will create awareness um, uh, within the society, hopefully. And um, it's, for me, a starting point. Back in South Korea, the government has been turning that conversation into policies. Forests are again abundant, and even some urban areas are turning green. Sejong is a purpose-built South Korean city designed to house half the country's government ministries. At its heart are these sprawling gardens that have attracted wildlife and over 10,000 visitors a year. It looks even more spectacular in summer, but perhaps the most remarkable thing about this natural reserve is that I'm standing on the rooftop of one of 15 government buildings connected by interlinking bridges, which make up the world's largest rooftop garden. Well, 
The garden saves the government money and dramatically cuts carbon emissions. 그냥 식물이 자랄 수 있는 환경을 조성해 준 거고요. 그로 인해서 다시 어느 연구 결과도 나와 있는데요. 1 제곱미터당 연간 2만 원의 에너지 절약 효과가 있다고 합니다. 우리 청사는 연간 14억 원 정도의 그 비용 예산 절감도 하고 있고요. 보시면 저쪽에 이제 태양광 시스템하고 또이 건물 지하로 지하 이게 지열을 이용해서 다시 이런 걸까지 다 에너지로 다 같이 사용을 하고 있습니다. The complex itself is green. But the cars and the appliances and everything else leave a big carbon footprint amplified by the short lifespans of most modern consumer products. Now the product life cycle is shortening faster and faster. So you have to develop some technology so that you can recycle those uh, you know, outdated products very effectively. So already in academia, people are paying attention to modularity when they design their product. In other words, you have to design the product in a way it is very effective to recycle. The solutions are as complex as the problems are abundant, but it is clear. We must start talking about our economies and the environment as one issue if we hope to leave a wealthy and healthy planet for future generations. For Assignment Asia, I'm Jack Barton. Since 2016, the United Nations has been pushing for the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. They are a set of interconnected targets for countries around the world to end poverty and improve people's lives while protecting the planet. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Ryan Chua in Beijing. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media. Are we ready? China, a nation with the largest population on Earth, assuming a greater role economically and politically on the world stage. Understanding China is critical for all, though difficult for some. Behind the scenes of China's transformation, I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. Join me to get closer to China. Thank you.